Okay, I guess I'm starting. Um, so this is kind of uh, an extended update and discussion on where we're going with Entity API in Drupal 7. Um, uh, I basically signed up to do this because I, I thought Catch was coming. <laughs> and I could rope him into work and do it with me, but happily, uh, Fago is here. Uh, and um, so he uh, put together some slides. And this is going to kind of extend from uh, what Greg talked about yesterday in terms of the core initiatives. Um, and uh, basically, we've been talking since. I don't know when, San Francisco. San Francisco, yeah. Yeah, about um, even long before that, if you look at Drupal core APIs, you compare node module, comment module, user module, um, you start to cry because you see that none of them call any of the same code in the same order. Drupal 7 is somewhat better in terms of having at least a little more consistency of, of which hooks are called. But if you look at the Drupal 7 code, you'll see that we have a comment hook we have a field hook, we have a entity generic hook. Um, so we basically have every hook repeated at least three times uh, with different variants, um, um, in part to support all kinds of legacy code that expects a certain naming. Um, so moving forward, we want to really unify uh, these. And this is really about solving a lot of the technical debt that's still present in Drupal 7. So, you know, clearly Drupal 7, a lot of changes with the field API went in sort of the last, relatively last minute. Um, things like making all entities able to have fields on them um, was relatively late in the development cycle. And so there's a lot of implications of that, uh, that change, um, and just bringing a better developer experience by having consistent API so that if you want to load or save any kind of entity, you don't have to think hard about which parameters to pass in or which kind of data uh, you need to use that it's going to be consistent uh, throughout uh, throughout every entity type, in, you know, both the core types and custom types. Um, so the idea here is that you know entities really become our generic framework for handling data. Um, people are starting to use them this way in Drupal seven. Uh, I just heard that, um, for example, voting API is considering making every making the votes on a node entities. Uh, now this, you know, initially I thought, wow, that's crazy. But <laughs> if you uh, consider that, at least in Drupal 7, that really an entity is just a wrapper around saving data to one table, well, this is exactly what voting API is already doing. It's just every time you record a vote, we insert a row into the table. Um, so, you know, let's, let's just think about using entities as our basically our storage framework for, for everything. Um, so we'll have consistent, a consistent API. We'll use this consistently every time we want to store data somewhere. Um, who is, I guess Damien was saying, you know, he wants all developers to forget about SQL. Um, so this is kind of, even regardless of what we think about the storage backend, this moves us in the direction of forgetting about SQL. Yes? So will you make some of the other things in Drupal entities like blocks, for instance? Um, good question. Is block you don't have to that, but just to think Yeah, that. I really Maybe think. We yeah. Blocks, um, What's that? They, they actually said, because uh, that question was raised when I was talking about making blocks an entity, and they said no. They said was, no? They said no. There was other problems, issues with doing that. Okay. For seven or for eight? For eight. Hmm. I guess blocks are kind of special because you, um, you know, things like a view can output a block. And they're, they're, they're really things for putting on pages, and so maybe they mm -hmm. are different from entities. Yeah. Mm -hmm. and it's an issue maybe to make, they, they, they should make custom blocks. Yeah, that's, that's what yeah, so mm -hmm. custom, custom mm -hmm. blocks Yeah, custom blocks probably should be entities mm -hmm. because, you know, you think about, okay, there's a blocks table, and it, you know, has right. a list of blocks, and each block is, each of those is basically right. static. Yeah, they're little pieces of content. Yeah. Little pieces of data, yeah. Mm -hmm. So, but yes, blocks in general, maybe not. Um, yeah, I think there really is a difference about uh, whether blocks as um, okay. concept of build, for building your site and right. as a display container and a custom block you want to. Right, so the custom block should probably be in a separate module and be a little entity. Um, anyway. Sure, yes. <laughs>
Um, so in Drupal 7, there's already you know some amount of pluggable storage for fields, uh, and uh, I think we'll talk more that you know we want to remove any any conception of field API as a separate API that that you know fields are the way that you add more data to entities. Therefore, if we have a unified way of storing data, entity data, then all the field uh, storage is underneath that entity um, system. Um, again, this you know integrates well with what Damien talked about sort of independently. If you saw his his discussion, and you know since you can you know make the storage pluggable, uh, very naturally you, you can if you want store entities as a whole in any kind of either local or remote data store. Um, I I'm I think neither of us is convinced that you need to be able to store parts of entities in different locations. Um, so, you know, we would really only see, you know, entire entities, you know, stored locally, stored remotely, uh, that should be supported. Uh, so in, in talking sort of about our general roadmap and how, um, how we're going to get there, you know, we can't do it all at once, obviously. Uh, <laughs> so the first step, and you know we, we have sort of uh, rough rough outlines of how this code would already look um, from San Francisco and Fago has already actually implemented uh, versions of this for Drupal seven in his entity module. Um, but you know basically taking that kind of code and defining an API so where you do all the basic you know create uh, you know load save delete operations for an entity and. You know, start out with some kind of test entity, maybe actual test cases, um, like simple test, so that we at least have confidence that you know, these basic functions work, um, and some kind of toy entity can be loaded and saved. Um, and that's the easy part, right? That we can basically already have that code from Drupal 7, from the entity module, at least a, a working version. We can argue about some of the details of how the API should look, you know, how we want to use OO, especially because it's PHP 5.3, uh, there's some interesting changes in uh, how you can use, for example, class uh, methods in PHP 5.3 versus 5.2. Uh, means we might refactor some of the existing code. Um, but the interesting part comes when we port, you know, start porting core entities. So the idea is we would basically uh, set up a parallel system, um, you know, so it would work for a custom entity, and then we would start porting core entities one by one uh, to this new API. And you know, as we do this, we would probably want to do performance testing for each core entity we're converting. Let's let's check and see if you know the performance gets better. Hopefully, um, hopefully not. If it gets significantly worse, then we have a problem and we need to revisit um, what we're doing. Um, that clearly needs to be an ongoing part of this cycle. Our hope is that actually performance will get better because, as I, I said before, you basically have you're evoking every hook roughly three times if you look at you know, the load and save, especially the save operations, for example, um, also load operations. These hooks are, are, are invoked extra times and we're gonna eliminate you know, a lot of that duplicated. Uh, hook invocations, we're also gonna be, as we go along, eliminating essentially duplicated code. Um, you know, so we'll remove, essentially be able to remove large swaths of the comment module, user module, node module, all the stuff that deals with you know, loading, saving, uh, maybe even viewing, um, those entities will get removed in favor of this more unified uh, version. That's what I was just going to ask you if the viewing was included in this master plan. Um, so Fago is going to talk more about his uh, uh, some of the details, um, but yeah, I think uh, at least you know you provide some kind of viewing mechanism that's generic for entities. Now it may be that you know nodes are special and need you know their own version of, of mm -hmm. viewing. But that means that if I define an entity, then maybe I don't have to define the viewing. Exactly. Yeah, that's the deal, yeah. Right, so to make it much easier for people to define sort of new entities as sort of content, um, and maybe you don't have to abuse the node for every kind of data source. <laughs> um, so uh, we'll come back to some questions about revisions. Um, as we start to get in, you know, so the first example might be comment module or something an entity without revisions, and then it gets even more interesting as we start uh, converting an entity type with revisions, um, like the node module. 
Um, and once, uh, once all the core entities are converted, basically at that point we can start refactoring the field storage uh, functions. So right now you, we have all these field attach functions and things like that that are in the various uh, load and save hooks. And so we would refactor those and move that, the code relevant there into the entity, basically storage controllers, right? So there would no longer be a separate way to load and save fields that's you know, distinct from the way that you load and save an entity. Okay. Uh, so status. Um, so uh, basically Fago and Catch have actually started on some of this. Um, the first step is, uh, which uh, looks like we need to reroll a uh, patch to move entity API into a module. And really this is just moving code around in core. So a lot of the entity API stuff in Drupal 7 ended up in system module, um, just because that's the dumping ground for, for new code. <laughs> uh, so, you know, as a first step to sort of, you know, having a, a clean, you know, place to work on this kind of API that we move, move all that code, that's really just moving things around. Um, we should be able to get that in pretty soon. Um, and then there's a, a work in progress, not, not yet, you know, ready to review or certainly not yeah, ready to commit. It's basically just uh, a port of the, the stuff of the entity pair module in, in Drupal 7 to Drupal 8 and uh, just the start of refactoring that to, to, to the version that we actually want to have later on. So it's work in progress, but it already basically works, but it's, yeah, needs work. So, you know, at least we do have um, an initial start, and um, once, you know, once this first one is done, then really the basic CRUD operations, I mean, that's, that's where we're defining the API, and that's where we will need to make some of the architectural decisions um, about how we use OO, um, how we break up the code, um, and other things like that that I think could be interesting. So um, one of the questions, um, if you remember from Chicago, um, we discussed, you know, should we have an, uh, an API that presents a, a CRUD interface to the developer or a crap interface to the developer? <laughs> um, so if you weren't there, uh, the difference is CRUD is create, read, update, delete, and crap is create, read, append, purge. Um, and the, dis the difference is in a crap model. <laughs> I think it's, isn't it an uh, archive purge? Uh, I'm, I'm not sure. I think it was. Was it append? Archive. Or is it archive? Archive. archive. Okay. Uh, okay, archive purge. Um, uh, but so two differences. I mean, basically in the, the crap model, um, we, we generally assume that we're always making revisions. Um, of, you know, so we never actually update in place. Um, and instead of deleting anything, we, we basically archive it and we might purge it later, actually delete it from storage, but that, that delete isn't an immediate operation. Uh, now, you could make crap look like CRUD to the developer, right? You don't have to tell the developer that you're archiving. You could, you could have a function called delete and behind the scenes it just, you know, flags it and doesn't actually delete it. Um, but I think one of the questions, you know, we as a community need to decide is what, what do we want the API to look like? Do we actually want, you know, a function called, you know, node archive or we'd rather have node delete? Um, I think people... What are, what are the implications beyond being able to undo your deletes? Um, I think, you know, undo your deletes is one. I think one we'll discuss later is if, let's say, you're synchronizing content between sites. Um, it might be better to synchronize the fact that you archived this node rather than trying to keep track of which nodes you've deleted, <coughs> right? So you're basically synchronizing the current state of the node as archived rather than trying to keep track of the fact that you deleted it. Um, and also it's basically a different approach to, to how revisions work because you just create a revision every time you, you edit or update something and you don't have to specifically say, okay, now I want to create a new revision. The code always does it. So, yeah. That also raises, though, because uh, entities are going to have fields to release other entities, uh, do all of the contained entities get automatically you know, released as well? Um, isn't that the amount of 
extra write suite and app to do every time you do an update. It's not just going to be one extra row for the containing in Kubeflow, but do we want to have an extra one for each of the containing instances? So when contained, you mean like using like a node reference or term reference field, also, or? So if you have revision one and revision two of some entity, mm -hmm. you've got a bunch of fields which contain other entities. Are they, are they do the as well? well Oh well, wait, but the, would the fields never contain entities, do they? Well, isn't that what you're talking about? No. 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 <laughs> I mean, the, I mean, the, at least normally I think you use reference. Yeah, usually you think it's a, it's a reference, and in Drupal 7 as a module, a field collection is basic, basically works that way that you have a, a collection of fields that is another entity, but yeah, in the end it's just an, an entity reference too. So for, for um, modules like that, it would be actually, probably it would make sense to, to do it that way, as I say, that you uh, create revisions of the field collection itself too, because for the user it should work like a whole entity. Yeah, but it's really in a certain case. So. I mean, if, if I misunderstood um, that, that's okay. It's still, the case still kind of stands, whether it's fields or entities. Do, does everything that gets contained get versioned as well as just the container? Because otherwise you can get in problems if Yes, uh, everything would be revisioned, yeah, of course. So you, you would end up with uh, some duplicated data and you would have to, to store more data. But the idea is that uh, data isn't, uh, isn't expensive today and uh, you might want to have the data later on. So uh, it's nice uh, when the data is there. But still you, you need a purge operations and yeah, probably you want to, to be able to configure how the purge operation works automatically too. Understand why you can't have. I mean, I, I'm not an expert on cred versus crap, but I don't understand why you can't say, well, there's no update in place, everything's a revision, but you could still allow delete. So I guess I don't understand why it's kind of why it's those. Sort so, of so the question the question is whether it's either or for revisions. I, I yes, I think it would be fine. Yes, you could say that when you update, you always create a new revision. That it's. I think the question here is more about what we present um, as the developer experience mm -hmm. versus what the implementation is. Mm -hmm. So, I mean, we could we could definitely say yes. Every time you call update, it creates a new revision. That's fine. Um, and we could also say every time you call delete, it marks the node as ar as archived. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Or. But I, I'm not sure why those two are linked. I guess they're not linked okay. directly. I'm I'm just yeah, um, yeah the. The real question is, you know, uh, do we want, as a developer experience, do you want to think about archiving content for later purging, or do you want to think about deleting it? What is the, mm -hmm. the better developer experience, or not even better, but like the the More easier different. one to comprehend, easier to, to mm -hmm. comprehend? Um, so, and and yes, then a sort of separate question is, um, do we really want to revision? Um, every chain, every, make every change a new revision, or is is there ever a value to updating in place other than you know worries about storage? I think you know there are cases where people do insane things of updating, you know, extremely frequently. I, I, I think are those actually valid, or that is that just broken code? So if if someone has a use case where really I want to be publishing and unpublishing my content you know, every five minutes or something like that, is that um, is that a valid use case or is there some, you know, should you just have found a better technique for that, whatever you're trying to achieve? So thinking about comments, like we don't revision comments right now, um, but that also means if you want to go back to the state of the database, the state of your site an hour ago, you can't. Mm -hmm. right? Everything you, you update in place, you can't really go back. So if you put revisions on everything, then you... Right, so that... <laughs> you don't have everything in entities, but... Right, so the comment is, you know, if you revision everything, including comments, you, you potentially could go back to the state of your site at some point in the past, at least in terms of your content, um, which may be very useful for certain uh, use cases also. Spam attack. Right? Yeah. Mm. <laughs> Personally, I think uh, for the for the developer, it should be really be a CRUD interface because this this is the interface that uh, developers know today and they are used to to using it. So, 
I think it uh, would be just a, another Drupalism if we would just uh, have archive and not delete and uh, we would have to teach that to, to all the developers. So I'm much in favor, favor of a card interface and I think still if we have a, a card interface uh, for developers, uh, we could implement grab in, in the entity controllers if you wanted. <laughs> so we could have grab and grab. <laughs> based on this whole uh, issue summary thing we've been going through, I'm just thinking about that. But, you know, in Node, you can update in place or you can make a revision and uh, it points on the entity level, but, but don't have a separate API for update in place versus revision. Just like for one entity, it's one way and for another, it's another way, but anyway. Right, so Jennifer's saying a single entity should not have both the option to update in place and have revisions regardless of how we yeah. move forward. So. Just a thought. Mm -hmm. Okay. I talked about this really briefly yesterday. Um, what about data that I would consider to be stateless or not revisionable or not desirable to be revisioned, particularly access control data, um, you know, node ownership? Um, I mean, it, it's a really nasty problem. If you get it, say you're using taxonomy for access control, right? And you change taxonomy between revision two and revision three, that means you have a different access control. Yeah, but I think if you... Uh, well, let's uh, repeat the question. So, oh, so Ken is saying um, revisions can make things really complicated uh, for something like access control if you have different taxonomy terms on revision one and revision two of a node. Um, yes. <laughs> um, one, of the, one of the problems in Drupal 7 is that I cannot declare an individual field to be non-revisional. Okay, so, and, and Ken saying, so for example, if I want a field that really controls node access, perhaps I don't want revisions on that field. I want it to be the same across all revisions so that if the current user can see the current node, they could also see all past revisions of that node, basically. Right. I mean, the statement I made yesterday was if we decide to go to everything's revisioned all the time, we can solve that problem. But I'm interested in, yeah, what are your thoughts on the implications of that problem? So right. So what are the imp yeah? So if we go to revisions all the time, how do we how do we solve this problem? Um, I have to admit I haven't thought about it too much. I mean I think the easiest case is you base something like access control off the current published revision or something like that for all the past revisions. But <coughs> that's, that's the de facto state now actually yeah. because node access is not revision. Um, it can be well. It could be, but it's not. Uh, but I mean there are legitimate use cases for saying the access controls should change based on revision to data. I mean, that's a legitimate request. I'm, I'm undecided on this issue. But it is a, it's a big problem in Drupal 7, actually. So, mm -hmm. I mean, somebody, the, the, the access to the current, to, to viewing the current, uh, sorry, the access to the current node is going to be based on the current sta state of all of the fields, right? Correct. Mm -hmm. But, I mean, in the, in the modules that I maintain, So, so, that, so that I don't have to deal with this problem. So Ken is saying he bypasses this problem in Drupal 7 by using his own tables and not using entity or field storage. Well, I mean, menu, the menu system has the same problem, right? Menus, paths, all that non-revision node property data is the exact same issue. Repeat that for reporting. Right, so, so part of the problem is also things like uh, paths on a node um, that you can't revision necessarily because the the link that it's referencing is not revisioned uh, along with it. Hmm. Yeah. Uh, what about new links and path aliases in Grab? So menu links and path aliases, are you asking should they be entities or are you saying? <laughs> yeah. Um, Good question. I mean, the yes, probably links should probably be entities. I mean, they are in in a sense data. Um, they really, you know, you can 
you can delete every menu link and your site still works, right? Same way you could delete every node, the site still works. You can. What about path aliases? Um, path aliases. I don't know. Have you? I haven't thought um, personally about it, but uh, um, my intuit, my, um, my intuition would be not to make them entity entities, but um, I must say I haven't really gave it a vote, so we would have to, uh, to need, uh, that definitely would need some discussion and would we, not have, we would have to need a look at that. Yeah. Okay, I think we, we should move on. <laughs> Yeah. yeah. So okay. We're we're close to the end of the. First, I mean, it's a basic continuation yeah. that. Yeah. Uh, Fago is going to do more himself. Oh, so you're, it, you're yeah. The and yeah. the second half, so it's basically <laughs> continuing for full. <laughs> um, so uh, also, yeah, Greg talked to us about UUIDs. Um, so we, even if we're not focusing on that initially, clearly we have to have that in the back of our mind as you know how we handle UUIDs. Um, so. You know, for the sake of simplicity and speed, probably most operations like the load operation, the default it will be to use the integer because if you're coming into a page, a path, you're going to have integer ID handy. Um, you don't want to have to go through the extra step of looking up the UUID. Um, but clearly, we're going to need to implement you know load functions that take a UUID either for you know a an entity or for a specific entity revision, um, and uh, one. You know, thing here is again, if we're doing <laughs> revisions, um, is there any use for having an integer ID for each revision, or should we just have a UUID? Um, so, if you think again about reference fields, generally you only reference effectively the current revision, which is uh, the shortcut to the current revision is the integer ID. Um, so, maybe there's no real cost uh, to only using UUIDs for to reference a revision, and that would make the code kind of simpler, um, you know, if you're trying to load a revision, you always get a very specific thing based on its UUID, um, rather than getting something that might be different on one site versus another site. Um, so, you know, again, part of where we're going with this is to move uh, to utilizing more of the OO features. Uh, so, um, you know, we'd think about having a base class um, that implements some kind of interface <laughs> Right, that would be common for everything in core. Every core entity would, would do this. Um, and that once we do that, we can start, again, defining specific classes for each entity type. So a node class, a comment class, a user class, a whatever class uh, you want. And that would you know, uh, either probably extend the, a base entity class in a lot of places, or at least implement this interface um, so that we always knew we could always check that you know object we're dealing with implement the right interface, um, and more specifically. We don't have standard class node anymore. That'd be great. Right, so we don't have standard class node anymore, and that means we can do actually better uh, checking on our data. Uh, so, uh, right, so you could do. All right, we'll skip ahead here. So in fact, you know, if you have an operation that should only operate on a node, you can you can type hint in PHP, right, and then PHP will you know, throw an exception or fail, I forget what kind of fatal error it gives you. If you pass a standard class into this, it no longer works. Why do you need this? Why don't you just have a, a method on the node that just says publish it on the node object? I mean, why do you need a function then? Well, this is just an example. Yeah. So, you know, mm -hmm. if you have uh, some kind of function or some kind of method that requires, that only operates on nodes, um, you know, as this is just a, you know. I don't think that we should do any other methods on, on nodes besides the, the methods uh, in the entity interface because uh, the entities really represent our, our data in Drupal and we sh so the, the object itself also should also only deal uh, with about the data. So they are really the representation of our data model. And if you think about it, uh, it's also the, the, only work, the only way it can work because Drupal is modular and any any module may provide uh, uh, further functions that work with nodes, and you won't be able to to get those uh, all in the class anyway. So it's really the, the only way it is consistent uh, across all modules, and I think it's uh, um, yeah pretty much fix, uh, fits to the 
uh, vision of having uh, entities um, representing your, your data in Drupal and not having entities to deal with anything or everything. <laughs> And let's see, we back up. I think there's one more discussion point we wanted to hit. Uh, maybe one back here. Yeah. yeah. Okay. So there are a couple more discussion points we want to have. I mean, this is core conversation. So, um, <laughs> so when we think about having an entity interface, um, uh, we're basically building on what we have in Drupal 7, which is that there's sort of a controller. And the controller actually... Um, it's not the, the entity class itself that does the heavy lifting, it's a controller. Um, and this is an abstraction that's a little confusing when you see it. Um, but uh, the value for this, especially as we move forward, is that we can have you know, standard controllers. So you define a new entity, I mean, and Drupal 7 already does this, you define a new entity type, you already have a default controller, which already handles storage, already handles load, save, all these other things for you. And you don't have to... Um, you know, embed all of that code in a default entity class that everything else is extending. Um, and, uh, you know, one, one thing we're thinking about for Drupal 8 is that we actually split this up a lot more. So there's, for Drupal 7, there's effectively one controller for, for each entity type, and it handles every possible operation in the sort of CRUD cycle. Uh, whereas for Drupal 8, perhaps we should, we should make this more, um, granular, so we have different uh, controller for storage, for caching, for display, for maybe building an edit form, maybe a different controller for access to that entity. Um, and by splitting that up, um, it would make it easier to customize the entity by basically, you know, substituting a different controller. Uh, so the question, will every entity be commentable? Um, could be. Could be. Uh, is it in Drupal 7? It no. isn't in Drupal 7. And, uh, <coughs> right. Yeah. I mean, in Drupal 7, we, we got close, but didn't go all the way to making comments, uh, basically a reference field. Um, so I think that's, that's sort of a side issue to this. Um, but... Um, mm. I think, you know, that might, you know, feed into the display controller, you know, maybe the display needs to know if it pulls, you know, a referenced comment thread. The idea of that is basically really that you only need to have the storage controller and that all other controllers are optional, so you um, know you have uh, methods to deal with your data. And then you have an easy way of enabling uh, more controllers. You can enable display controller, form controller, um, access controller. And so you can uh, easily provide entity types that do more or do, win, uh, or do less. Also, and then also, if you uh, implement a new entity type, when you're implementing the form or the display, you can uh, override and extend the controller to do your customizations in that way. So. So that brings us sort of to the next discussion point, which um, this is really an open question. I mean, we're discussing and don't have an answer whether uh, when you want to customize an entity type, do you want to focus the customizations on the entity class um, or on the controller? And an example of this is, um, I guess, comment module. Um, where it does some manipulations of the data on the comment. Uh, I think it maybe calculates the threading, mm. some other things during the save operation. So should that kind of special logic, should that live in the comment class or should that live in the comment uh, storage controller? Um, now, you know, there's sort of arguments both ways. Um, so if you put it in the storage controller, maybe you end up having to co replicate that code if you define a new storage for comments. Um, if you put it in the comment class, um, you know, it, it means you know, you're kind of carrying around more, uh, more code with comments. I, I don't know, what was the other, you felt like there's some downside to this? Mm, no, I don't, actually can't think of any downside. Okay, so, <laughs> you know, there's, you know, so uh, there's maybe not the obvious downsides, but, but it means that the, the, these entity classes moving move from being sort of a, a pure semantic thing mm. where they, they just 
uh, sort of reference their controllers and have some um, yeah maybe some properties. maybe the downside is that it's a little bit split up between the entity class and, and the controller which cares about the storage right so, so uh, Thomas. Right, so Thomas says another downside is you can't have sort of an external function that really invokes a save uh, for an entity, which you might want to do as a programmatic operation. Um, you would always end up going through a class method or an instance method. Um, again, yeah, it's not clear that this is a downside because maybe every time you save an entity, you need to instantiate it any anyhow. Um, so then you have the instance and you call save on it. Um, but you know, it, it is a potential downside if we want to have sort of functional, functional uh, forms of a lot of these things where you can just call something like entity save rather than calling you know, dollar node you know, save. I think uh, the, the main advantage of uh, putting the customizations in, in the entity class would be that it makes it easier to uh, make the, the storage controller pluggable. Um, but but uh, if we um, really would go in the direction of the document-oriented storage, like Damien proposed it, um, it might be not necessary at all to, to have the controllers pluggable. So that's definitely a point we need to discuss further. And yeah, I think we have one more thing we want to discuss before Fago moves on to his section, which was, yeah, just a little more about document-oriented storage and kind of thinking ahead, uh, Drupal 8 and even beyond. Um, if, if we decide that document-oriented storage is the right answer and the way we wanna uh, move, then there's no reason we can't have different fields for each instance of an entity. Um, so you could decide you know, a particular node uh, gets a file field and no other nodes of that node type have a file field, uh, for example. And is that, you know, how valuable is that? Is that, um, you know, does that make things so difficult that we want to, don't want to go there? Or does that add such great flexibility? And really is that much better than sort of the um, bundle system we have now where every node is constrained to have exactly the same fields? Um, so I think, you know, that's, that's something Damien didn't really mention with document-oriented storage, which is actually a really important um, implication of using document-oriented storage versus the relational storage we use now for entities. And so we can discuss now or, or we'll just leave you with this thought and move yeah. on to. Yeah. Okay, so I think we just move on. Okay. <laughs> so um, I want to shortly talk about the entity property UI. So, um, if you think of an entity in Drupal 7, uh, you, if you, when you have the entity object in code and you just know it's an entity and you don't really know its, its type, so the problem is with it, you can't really do a lot of it, right? So you, in core, if you, if you know the entity type, you, you can uh, do some stuff like getting the label, the UI, and also it would be nice to save it once we have the, the card thing in Drupal 8. So, with the proposed stuff, we, we talked earlier about it, basically we would be able to, to, to do stuff like that. <clears throat> but still, we, we won't be able to, to have a look at what is inside the entity. <clears throat> so, if you have an everyday entity object there, uh, I think it would be really important so, uh, that you are able to get a list of all the, the properties the entity has. has so you uh, can actually do something with that properties. So you need to be able to get some information about that properties. And also there need to be uh, some uh, handy little getters and setters that they allow you to, to get and set the property values. Yeah. What do you mean by properties here? Pro uh, what types of things property? What, what is a property? Yeah. Okay, uh, Jennifer asked what uh, a property actually is. <laughs> and when I'm talking about an entity property, I, I mean, um, something that is not a field, like um, not status, not alpha, so. But um, what my, my talk really is about is uh, making uh, that properties more powerful and making them more 
similar to what a field is. So there's actually not that much a difference between those. So yes, uh, that way I think um, a field should be a property too, so that uh, it's really working the same way. So uh, when you have a look at the getters and the setters, I think it really it's really important that developers can use them for fields and for properties the same way. And additionally, if you look at the example, just get me in and property, you need to know somehow what you're getting. So you need to uh, have to um, have in property information, which tells you what is the data type you're getting, um, or, and is it the user, is it uh, just a numeric ID or stuff like that, you really need to have some, some meta information about it. And I also think it would be nice to have uh, some, some labels and descriptions included for, for some modules that make use of that properties in, in some UI. <coughs> so, uh, actually there's uh, some discussions we, we had with uh, Catch and Krell about whether we want to do some lazy loading of entities and whether we want to use some magic to trigger the, the lazy loading. So in PHP, you could implement an, a magic function, underscore, underscore, get, which then is automatically invoked if you access an, an entity property that is not there. <coughs> so that way, uh, we could uh, actually uh, do entity objects that are, are not loaded, so they con contain only the entity ID, and as soon as you access the property, it automatically gets loaded. So you don't, that way you don't uh, need to, to pass uh, the entity ID and the entity type around anymore. You could just instantiate an object which only contains the ID and is not loaded yet, and pass it around. So we would have uh, a more um, uniform API and developers don't, want, don't uh, have to deal anymore about uh, specifically loading a certain entity if they only have the ID, or is it loaded yet or not. The question is, uh, doesn't it, it imply that we don't uh, need to get us and set us anymore? Um, to some extent, yes, but internally they still would use the get us and set us. And um, also, I'm, I'm not really a, a big fan of that idea because it uh, really um, makes it difficult to, to track the code flow. And uh, if you just access in property, you are not really, you can't be really sure of what happens. And uh, if the developer does that, he might not be aware of the fact that it might trigger some loading somewhere else. So um, it, um, I think we need to be careful with that. And also um, it might to, to lead to, to some um, unexpected consequences if you, uh, just write an arbitrary uh, property, you, uh, an arbitrary entity, and it triggers some code uh, somewhere else you don't expect it, and it really can lead to uh, some strange side effects. So um, what um, we came up with is that we want to restrict that uh, to uh, the list of defined properties. So it is uh, very important that we have something like a hook entity property info that makes it uh, possible to define the list of properties that's the list of properties that are actually available, and then we can restrict the magic to that. Also, additionally, it would be just um, the default way of getting and setting a property to directly access it, but if in more advanced uh, situations, like uh, when you need to get a property or a field in a certain language or stuff like that, uh, it would be nice to have a getter where you can just specify the language option. Yep, Peter? Yeah. I mean, I think it's still also worth I mean, this lazy loading, yeah, it's not clear whether it's actually a good optimization, so probably mm -hmm. should be postponed until everything else is working. Yes, Peter mentions it's not clear whether it's really a, an actually a good idea to do, and yeah, it's really uh, just an open point for discussion and uh, not anything we are um, sure we, we should implement that. Jennifer? But if we have if we have document oriented storage, presumably most of the properties are all and fields and all the stuff about the, the entity are all maybe stored in one place anyway. So if you load one of them, you get everything. Is that right? I don't know. 
Um, I'm not sure if I understand the so question. I'm not, I'm not sure what, what, what is it saving uh, oh, you? What is it saving you to do this? Um, what, what is it saving you to do this? Uh, basically, that you don't have to care about uh, whether you pass around an entity ID or a fully loaded entity object. So for the, um, the code that it's getting code, you don't have to care anymore. Mm -hmm. So that's the main advantage. And that way, uh, you could actually uh, end up with some optimizations that you pass around an entity object that actually in the end you never get loaded because some code decides, oh, I don't want to deal with that entity anymore. and uh, you just keep loading it uh, at all. So that way it might lead to some impo performance improvements. Also, there are two different ideas uh, of implementing that. So uh, Catch came up with the idea of uh, having it managed by the controller so that in the end, each time you uh, instantiate an entity object, uh, it registers it in, at the controller. And then uh, if uh, loading an entity object is triggered, the controller uh, just starts and actually loads all the uh, entities that have been registered in the, in the controller. So it, if there's uh, a page and uh, three nodes would be used on that page, and as soon as the, the first node would be loaded, uh, the controller would be able to do an entity load multiple for that would lead some, lead some performance improvement. Um, personally, I'm not sure about whether we should do that because it might be a bit strange if you are using a single node and you are loading a single node and somehow um, multiple nodes get loaded and all the hooks fire up, so it might be uh, a bit unexpected for developers. So um, a different approach would be that we uh, do it only in a more declarative way so that we have something like an entity set class which allows you to create an object which uh, basically represents an array of entities but which are not loaded immediately but are um, lazy loaded as soon as soon as you use a single entity of the set. Okay. And in regard to properties, it's uh, really important to cover some uh, additional metadata. So uh, if you think um, about what you want to do with an entity and what you want to do to be able to do with an entity, I think it's also a good idea to think of uh, Drupal as an, a REST server. Uh, if you have each entity as a REST resource, what uh, you need to be able to, to do and what you need to be able to, uh, to know about the entity in, in order to make things happen. So if you want to update an arbitrary entity, you really need to know is the current user allowed to do the update. So you really need to have property level access metadata so you know who is allowed to, to change the node order or not, and so on. And we basically have that right now for fields, but I think we really need to have a, a common API for that for all properties. And uh, the very same way it's for validation. If you um, are updating arbitrary entities um, based on the, in the general fashion, we really need a, a, a validation API that is decoupled from form validation, but uh, works generally so you could do just a, a web service called a save an entity, and if the data doesn't fit, uh, it needs to uh, give you an error. So we definitely need a validation API for that so we can handle that. And we probably, we probably want to look uh, into how we can make a good validation API that uh, works well for, for form validation too, but is decoupled from form validation. And then there's also the need for having a translation for, for properties. So I think it uh, would be really important to have uh, each property uh, being able to, to be marked as translatable. So that basically it behaves like a translatable field. <coughs> and uh, all APIs um, need to be aware of that fact and need to take it into account. So the, yep. Yep, uh, it's, it's really much very similar to fields, and I'm, I'm going to uh, talk about that later on. Well. Okay, so in, in Drupal 7, I've implemented lots of them in the Entity API module, and it basically has some support for handling access validation, and also it has a simple marker for translation uh, for all entity properties. So you could basically implement lots of stuff 
uh, of that already by implementing the Entity Property Information API of the Entity API module in Drupal 7. But really the problem with it, it's, it's not native, it's just an additional layer above the entity system. We have a core and we ideally uh, you want to use the, the entity wrappers it provides. Uh, this, these are um, uh, some, some classes that wrap the entity objects that allow you to make use of the, the API easily. So it's really more a separate system built on top of the core entity, core entity API, API we have. And I think it's uh, working already pretty well, but the problem is just, yeah, it's not native. We have wrappers and we don't want to have that. We want to have the nice and pretty API out of the box. So this is how it uh, looks like uh, for Drupal 7. Uh, it's a property information array for the uh, node created property. And as you see, it basically specifies a label and the, and the type. So the, the type of it is state, and what's really important here is that actually it's uh, documented and defined somewhere how the, the data of a certain uh, type looks like. So I've just, uh, for the entity API module in Drupal 7, I've just specified a date has to be timestamp. So anyone who, who gets the date uh, knows what he is getting and actually can do something with it. Then there's also some additional metadata, like um, setter callback, um, that specifies how the data is actually set on an entity, and the permissions and description and stuff like that, yeah. <clears throat> so for the data types, I, I think it would be important that we have something like a hook that also specifies the data types that are available in the systems. Um, and the, the hook and the system has to come with a set of predefined simple data types um, that basically for the entity API module in Drupal 7, I've, I've took the, the data types that are very similar to XML, XML schema, schema, because it's a set of data types that is uh, powerful enough to basically uh, depict any data you need. Then uh, you also want to have uh, entities as um, supported as regular data types. You can just say, oh, it's a user entity. And uh, we also need to have something like complex types, so uh, a data type that is compound and built of, of multiple other simple data types. Like if you think if, of a file field, it actually has uh, a file and a description and stuff like that. So it, this actually is some kind of a data structure that exists of uh, other data types. <clears throat> and also, uh, built up in the data types, we can also uh, build other APIs. So if you think uh, of the storage API or the display API or um, forms APIs, or I think of the them in a widget API, uh, or whether something is compatible with something other, so whether a property is compatible with a, a certain plugin, with a certain display plugin or a widget plugin, really should depend on the property information, in particular on the data type. So <clears throat> once we have um, a specified set of property information, we really can build lots of components that um, are designed to work with a certain kind of data. And the nice thing then actually is that you can uh, give it any kind of data that uh, fulfills the, the defined interface and it just works. Okay, so let's uh, have a look about how translation would work in that idea. So I think it really needs uh, to be built in so that any property can be marked as translatable, as I said previously. Then also the, the getter and setter uh, should really support an, an optional uh, language key. So you can get and set and probably in a certain language if you want. But uh, we really need an easy way to, to access and set the default language by default. So. Um, I think if you just access the, the property on, on the entity level, it always should make use of the default language, uh, regardless whether the, so you don't have to deal with it, uh, whether the property is translatable or not, if you don't want to have, to, if you don't want to care about that. But if you want to access a certain language of a translatable property, you still can use the dedicated getters and setters to get, to get and set the values. Pina? So would that work for fields? Yeah, I think we, Peter, asked key, mm, Peter asked whether this uh, should work for fields too, yes. And I think it's really important that we should make it work that way for fields too, because right now this is really a developer experience issue that we always have that uh, deeply nested data structure. And we really should uh, make sure that it's as easy as possible for developers.
Uh, would it work with the current context well, language? No, I think there's something like an uh, interface language and like a content language. It's right. So I think uh, there are different kind of languages, and um, probably the entity type um, might want to have a way to specify what kind of language he wants to use. But basically, I think uh, we want to use the content language for that. Okay. So. This is uh, how I would imagine that uh, this actually could work and play together. So we have an, an hook that defines property information and that defines how the, the entity properties actually look like. <coughs> and that basically would be the contract for everyone uh, that m uses an entity. So the, the storage system really would have to take care uh, about uh, loading or storing entities that look exactly that way, and then also all other systems that do something with an entity would also uh, know what they expect. They actual, actually really would know, okay, this is the way the data looks like, and this is the way the data has to look like when I want to, to write it back. So um, we could, be, uh, could do the display components and form components that uh, really um, make use of that metadata and work exactly with the data as it is specified. And actually the nice thing here is that we uh, could start doing display and form components uh, like we have them for the field API and work them as, uh, and make them work on top of the defined property information. So we could go and start reusing that um, widget and display formatters also for regular entity properties. If we are able to decouple it, and if we are just say, okay, they need that kind of certain data, we can use them with any data. And so we are, would be able to use them not only for fields, but only from an API level. Yes, Klaus? Uh, so what you're saying is that I don't have to implement hook schema anymore if I implement the hook and the property information. <coughs> Klaus asks whether um, one has to, has to implement hook schema anymore when one, if one implements uh, hook entity property info. And yes, I think we, we should do it that way, but it really depends on, on the entity controller we build. So in the first step, it might be easier that, that we have it just duplicated, just uh, as an interim step during development. But in the, in the end, I think we really want to have just the hook entity property info from which the, uh, the storage controller can derive all the necessary information for, for storing it. Okay, so I don't have much time anymore, but um, storage, yeah, I think that the important thing is that the entity property information outlines the way the data, data has to look like, and uh, it has to store that way. That way, it would be really um, simple to say, we have something like a translatable node title, because we only would have to care that the storage layer, that the entity controller uh, stores it in the appropriate fashion. And, and uh, the upper layers, like the, the formatters and all the getters and setters, really don't, should have to care how, how it's stored. And later, if we have some uh, better um, or automated storage system, it could be even be handled in an automated fashion. But I think the nice thing, if we uh, start with an um, uh, entity property information system, is that we uh, could uh, could uh, do it manually in the start, just implement uh, manual entity controllers, uh, which uh, just do it similar to um, like it is now. And in, the l in the long uh, term, we can improve things and make that even work more automated. Yes, and also the question is how do we make the entity controllers swappable, but we talked a little bit about that earlier already. So. I think the, the main question now is what is in property now? Is it the same than a field or not? And I think, yeah, if we improve the property system that way, it's really pretty much uh, like an improved field API, but it's uh, more decoupled. So we have uh, field API decoupled in separate APIs that are reusable independently of fields. So what I think then what a field ends up being is really uh, just another property, so I feel this really just another property, but which is custom and configurable, so that in a way that the user has defined, this is a field, and uh, I have a new, um, uh, a new image on the node, a new file on the node, but uh, it's not defined uh, by a module, and it's not required by a module to work. Yes, so, yeah, the really important thing is, 
fields and properties, the interface should be the same, and developers shouldn't have to care. Okay, thank you. <laughs>